following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Students who have been studying our website, lectures, books, find a true encyclopedia of knowledge, information, teachings about everything related with spirituality, religion, philosophy, science, art, all of which we collect together under the title Gnosis. That Greek word, which is strictly translated as knowledge, actually refers to something a little bit different. It refers to the kind of knowledge that we know for ourselves, not something that we read or heard about, but something that we have experienced, something we have confirmed and proven. In this era, in these days, Humanity now has access to teachings that were held secret, held sacred, kept private for thousands of years and at great cost. Many who encounter these teachings wonder why weren't these teachings made available sooner? Why wasn't humanity given access to this knowledge before today? And in that questioning, they understandably feel compassion and concern for humanity and want humanity to achieve union with the light. But in that question, people tend to forget the stewardship, the lineage, the great sacrifices that were made to preserve that teaching, and the great sacrifices that were made in order to acquire it and become part of that lineage to protect that teaching and preserve that teaching. You see, today we take this knowledge for granted. So the website, or the different websites that offer the Gnostic teachings, the many books, the hundreds of lectures, open doorways to fields of knowledge that were before closed. And for us now to access that is a tremendous thing. Truly. It is a gift of value of which we cannot even begin to estimate. Whose true meaning and importance is beyond our current comprehension. But sadly, students take advantage or rather they take it for granted. We take it as something like anything else we read on the internet or in any other book that we find, any other theory or philosophy that we discover. We fail to recognize because of the state of our consciousness, the difference. So today I want to point out that difference. That is why for today's lecture, out of the norm of the recent lectures, we have no graphics. We have no quotes. 
We have no distraction. What I want to encourage for you as the listener is to learn now to listen. To actually listen. As if you were listening for the first time in your memory, in your existence. To actually hear what this teaching is. Rather than taking in the words and the concepts and comparing them with your intellect or taking them in with your heart and comparing them with your beliefs and seeing if these concepts and notions and ex emotions you experience during the lecture feel good or feel bad and judging it based on that. And rather than reacting to the concepts and impulses and sensations you experience by receiving this knowledge. Instinctively, reacting because of sensations or how it makes you feel uncomfortable or feel excited or whatever reaction you may have in an instinctive level, I want to encourage you to hear it with your consciousness. To state it another way, with your soul. With your being. In this teaching, we talk about the being. You will always hear this word, the being, the innermost. Sometimes we say spirit. And this is another one of these terms that we take for granted and fail to truly comprehend what it means. To listen with your being, with your consciousness, means that you have an open mind, a mind that is not clouded, that is not comparing, that is not stressed, excited, fearful, anxious, but rather is serene, open, receptive, calm, and capable of learning something new. Recall for yourself for a moment a memory of that time when you were young, when you went to school, and you knew you did not know. And you knew the teacher knew. And the teacher would point to you how you could also come to know. So you would listen, wanting to know. It is that state of receptivity that the mind of a child has, that the Gnostic student needs to have. A mind that is a beginner, that is not an expert, that has never read anything, that doesn't assume anything or presume anything. With this sort of open, receptive attitude, these teachings can plant seeds in your soul. This is their purpose. To plant something in you that can grow and spring to life. These teachings are a path to life. To living. L'chaim. To life. Which is that famous greeting or cheer from the Jewish tradition. That phrase actually is very important and meaningful because that idea or concept of to life is what the whole scripture is about in the Judeo-Christian tradition, about discovering and entering the path to life, to living. And what that implies is that we are not yet living. And this is a profound truth. And if we were to realize that truth, we would not live how we do. The problem that we have is that we think we're already living. We think we are already being when we are not. We have what we call in this tradition, a conditioned consciousness. And what in scripture is called a state of sleep. And this is why throughout the scriptures, we find 
this call made by the masters to awake the soul, to awaken, to be alert. That awakening is not a theory. It isn't a concept. It isn't philosophical. It isn't a matter of debate. It is something that one experiences, and not in the past, and not in the future, but right now. To be awake is to be conscious of this moment, of everything that one can perceive, to the limits of that perception, and then to push against those limits to expand them. This, stated simply, is the true purpose of all religion. To expand the consciousness, to awaken it, to bring it out of the dust of the earth so that it can rise back to where it belongs, which is united with divinity, with purity, with the absolute. It's at this point that many students and devotees of different religions become confused because we already have this state of being that is clouded, confused, believing that it is awake, believing that it is alive and being. We don't understand what true being is, what true living is, to be awake, to be alive. And yet I think for most people, if we open our minds and try to remember that sensation of being awake, we probably can find some moments in our experience when we truly felt alive. Moments that we couldn't characterize or explain to anyone, but moments in which we felt and truly experienced that life is not the way we normally experience it. That truly, we are normally in a dreamy, sleepy state. And at certain moments in our experience, because of the way the light was coming through the trees, or because we had a strong shock of some kind, suddenly, our senses became fully aware. Very bright, very clear. And we perceived things in a way we never saw them before. And then suddenly, the experience was gone just as fast. That type of insight can be provoked. It can be stimulated. It can be grown. It can be expanded. That's why we study meditation. It's the science of meditation that facilitates the expansion of that type of experience. What we're describing here in synthesis is the state of our consciousness. And that that state is not permanent. Moreover, it is not the same for everyone. Every living thing has consciousness in its level and experiences being according to its condition. So if we, as scientists of life, study a child, observe a child. We see that that child is living, is in the moment, is truly astonished with things that we don't even see, things that we don't even think have any meaning at all. A child sees a cup, a box, a rock, a stick, and for that child, that thing is so amazing. A child sees a bug, a bubble, a cloud, and the child is struck with astonishment and has a beautiful smile as that being reflects in itself the beauty of nature. But when we become older, we lose that. We don't see it anymore. It's still there but we don't see it because we're not looking. In the same way, we don't hear. 
we don't listen. In the same way, we don't read. We don't truly perceive what we are perceiving. The perceptions that flow into us constantly, instead of being received by the consciousness, by our soul, and are experienced in their fullness, instead, those perceptions become absorbed by our memories, by our past. And everything that we see and hear and read and think and feel, we just compare. We don't really see where we are. We don't really see who we're talking to or hear the words they're saying. We hear how those sensations are translated by our mind. We do this all day, every day. Whatever we're doing through the course of our daily lives, we are in a constant process of simply translating sensations in accordance with pre-existing concepts. We don't see the tree. We don't see the car. We don't see our roommate or our spouse. We only see the mirrored reflections of our mind. We have a perception of that person as irritable, as annoying. And whenever we encounter that person, we are encountering our perception of them. We don't even really see the person because they may not be that way that day, but still we are perceiving them according to our memory of them. This is a very profound mechanism that is modifying our every perception. And this is why we're in the state that we're in now. Why this planet is in its state of decay. Why society is crumbling. Because none of us see each other. None of us feel each other. We are each in our own world, pursuing our desires psychological desires. Stated simply, we are asleep, conditioned by our memories, by our cravings, by our fears, by our pride and lust and envy. And the mind is encaged in a making of its own. And sadly, we then approach teachings like this and unskilled in seeing clearly, we take those teachings and add them to our cage. We fail to use the teachings to shatter the cage. Instead, we make our cage more complicated. And this is why we see religions, spiritual teachings throughout the world in a state of conflict. Preaching harmony, trying to guide people towards peace and serenity and insight, but instead creating conflict. This is as true of the Gnostic tradition as it is of any tradition in the world. In this tradition, we have a grave responsibility to provide the purest possible teachings we can to give the souls a chance to free themselves from their self-made cages. But unfortunately, all of us are in cages too. All of the instructors and guides are also in their own cages. And so conflict ensues, complications, misunderstandings, problems. But students, being inexperienced, being asleep, want the spiritual leaders to already be completely finished with their work and to be prophets and saints and resurrected masters and fail to recognize that all of us are in the same boat. All of us on this planet. 
There are masters here on this planet helping. But they do that anonymously because they know they cannot trust us. Because every time that we find a genuine master, we kill them. That's how strong the ego is in us. That's how strong our craving is to remain in the cage. Is that anyone that shows us the cage, we turn against them. We don't want to hear about the imprisonment that we've created for ourselves. We want someone to tell us everything's going to be okay and take us out of the cage easily. But this is impossible. It can't happen. Nature doesn't work that way. Cause and effect simply does not allow it. The only way to become liberated is by your own hands, through your own work. And the only way to achieve that is to destroy the cage. That cage is the mind. We call it pride, envy, greed, gluttony, laziness, lust, anger, avarice. There are thousands of names for all the parts and pieces of the mind that we have made. Freedom from that can only come in one way, and that's through the destruction of that cage. That destruction can only happen through our own efforts to make it happen. And that effort cannot happen in the future. There is no such thing as future. That is an illusion. The only thing that exists is this now. And when you can grasp that, not just occasionally, but truly root yourself in being here and now, you can then find the door out of the cage. This is the only way. In order to achieve it, to actually succeed in the complete destruction of the cage that traps us, we need a lot of help. This is undeniable. We need to know how to do it, so we need the teaching. We need guidance, because we're very foolish. So we need teachers who are experienced, who can guide us. But we need more than that too. We need divinity. We need to remember that we are not alone. That even though we have created this complicated, insane world, we are not alone in it ever. We just have forgotten that. That state of being here and now is what gives you access to starting to remember your being, your innermost. So you see, we're using the same word in two ways. And that's because they're related. Our state of being is the state of our consciousness right now. We can also call this our level of being. This is the condition of our soul in this exact moment. What is the condition of our soul? Are we distracted? Are we comparing everything with the intellect that we hear? Is our memory constantly trying to distract us? Is something else distracting us? For example, if we're listening to the lecture, but also browsing the internet, you are not here and now. If you're listening to the lecture, but also doing other things, then you are not present, really listening. But this is our habit. We are so habitual with a state of distraction that we want to feel that way all the time. To be doing more than one thing at a time. To us, it feels like an accomplishment, but in fact, it's a condition of being asleep. It's a state of distraction. 
If we can access truly being here and now, truly using all of our senses to the fullest of their power, and really being conscious of being alive, that is what gives us access to experiencing our being. In other words, our God, our innermost. You can call it Buddha, Allah, anything, any names. The names don't matter. That beingness is a portion of the absolute, of the everything. And we come from that. To self-realize is to realize through experience that. And that doesn't happen in the future. It happens now by opening the door. It doesn't happen in your intellect. It doesn't happen in your imagination. It doesn't happen in a book. It doesn't happen in a temple or in another country or in another planet. Which we all want to go somewhere else to achieve self-realization, right? We feel like, I can't do it here. It's too hard. I need to go somewhere else. That's a, that's a distraction of the ego. The realization of being depends on only one thing, to awaken and realize it. That's all it depends on. Unfortunately for us, we have built such a complicated cage around our consciousness. We don't have sufficient energy to have that experience on our own. So we need energy. And now we come to the main thing that we always talk about in these teachings. Using energy. Saving it, converting it, transforming it, and using it wisely. The energy we need to awaken is in every atom of our being. For us here and now, in this physical world, the po most powerful energy we have access to is in our sexual energy. This is why we address it persistently. Because that energy has incredible power. But it needs to be understood very clearly that energy is not only there in the sexual matter, physical matter. When you study Tantra and you study the sacred scriptures, I'm talking about the ones that were never made public. They, they state very clearly that that energy, that root creative energy is in every atom. That's why we call it Christ. Esoterically, that term means fire, but not physical fire. It means the fire that makes something live. Physically, to make something live, we need the sexual act to produce a living vessel so that something can live in it. So that some thing, some entity, can have its beingness in that vessel. So... That life comes through sexuality. But that life, that fire, burns in every atom of that newborn thing. Not just its sexual energy. It burns in its mind, in its heart, in its body, in everything. And not just physically, but internally. So in this tradition, when we talk about transmutation, and we talk about chastity, we're talking about the transmutation of all of the energy you have in every cell, in every organ, and not just physically, but emotionally and mentally, in every level of ourselves. All of that energy is necessary to transform the entirety of us into something new. In other words, it is impossible to awaken without energy. You can easily prove this to yourself. All you have to do is with a scientific mind, 
go to all the religions, all the yoga schools, and see how they practice. And see the results. And you will see that those places where they waste energy, physically, emotionally, mentally, they are not awakening in the light. They are not awakening towards life. They have no energy for it. In the scriptures, it states, in the book of Daniel, actually, I'll read it to you. I have the quote here. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. This is a very important passage in the Old Testament. It's pointing out that this pathway, which we call religion, is like any other road. You approach, you're in the wilderness, and suddenly you find the road. And we all think that all you have to do is get on the road and start walking, and you're going to go to God. But it isn't that way. That road goes two ways. Any road that you find, if you were in the jungle and suddenly you discover a road, you then have to decide, which way do I go? But having been in the jungle, you have no idea. Isn't it true? How do you know which way to go? So what do you rely on? How do you get guided? How do you find the way? Well, if there's anyone around or if there's anyone walking there, you ask them. And what if most of the people are walking one way? Won't you go with them? You'll think, well, everybody else is going that way, so that must be the right way to go. That's what we do. That's because our mind is still at that level. We feel that if everyone's doing it, it must be safe. It must be okay. That must be right. This is what we call collective mind. This is evidence that we are still animals because we still move with the herd. So we get on that road and we follow everybody else, but we don't really know where we're going. Everybody says, oh, we're all going to God. So to walk this way, you have to do it this way and this way. You have to do what we're doing. And we'll follow this road and we're all going to get to God. And we're all very happy about it. But nobody really knows because nobody's been there. Everybody else on that road came out of the jungle too. And they don't know where they're going. But everybody else was going that way, so it must be okay. Every once in a while, someone's going the other direction. So what do all those people do? Hey, you're going the wrong way. It's not that way. Are you crazy? You shouldn't go that way. It's this way. And they all tell that solitary person that they're wrong. It's very obvious what I'm pointing towards. These teachings go against the current. They go against the flow of society. They disagree with everything about this world. Everything. To truly reach divinity, everything that doesn't belong with divinity must be left behind. The material things are completely irrelevant. What matters here is the psychological things. To truly reach divinity, we have to abandon the way towards death. We have to awaken in the way towards life. That life emerges in us. And we will experience it. It's scientific. It's unavoidable. If we are actually applying these principles daily, it is unavoidable to experience its results. If we are not experiencing the results, there are only two reasons why. One is we're doing it wrong and we need to change how we're doing it. The second is karma. We may need to pay. In either case, the only answer is to keep going. To revise our practice, to continually improve our understanding of the teaching and our application of it constantly. This requires that we are very honest with ourselves. 
We don't have to tell anyone else anything. But with ourselves, we must be honest. And the best place to have that honesty and to express that sincerity is in prayer. Daily. To actually take the time with your heart, with your soul, to reach out to divinity and speak your heart. To be honest in the face of your own inner being, in the presence of your inner being, and facing yourself, to be honest. That effort is facilitated in a really beautiful way by adding to it a mirror. Do this type of prayer looking directly into your own eyes in a mirror. Patiently, but looking into yourself. You don't have to speak aloud. You can speak silently in your mind, in your heart. But when you do it this way, something is added. It's not a complicated thing, but it can open your heart. And it can show you how you're lying to yourself. To understand the purpose of all this, it's good for us to reevaluate these teachings and reevaluate our application of them. So, this is why I brought us back to this very basic fundamental concepts. Because without understanding these things, all of the knowledge and terms and meanings and symbols mean nothing. We can memorize the books and lectures and it will mean nothing if we aren't actually awakening. To actually awaken requires that you know what you're awakening and how you're doing it. That scripture stated very clearly that there are two results. That many will awaken from the dust of the earth. What is the earth? It is our body. Adama. And from that dust, the being creates the man. Remember in Genesis, it explains this. The man, Adam, which is our being, the primordial perfect being, is created out of the dust. How? Through the process of awakening. But see, that scripture from Daniel states that there are two ways to awaken from the dust. One, to life. That word life is hai in Hebrew. It's spelled with two letters. Hey. And Yod. I'm sorry, it's Het. Het and Yod. Those two letters have a lot of significance, and I recommend you study them. But in synthesis, that word implies not just physically living matter, it means spiritually alive. And we know this is true because the way that word is used in Genesis is that Adam is made into a living soul. Nefesh Haya. That is our goal. We aren't that yet. We have Nefesh, which is a soul, but it is an animal soul. It is very instinctive. It is ruled by its passions. We don't rule it, spiritually speaking, physically speaking, mentally, emotionally. All of us on this planet behave and live and exist as animals. We call ourselves human beings, but we have not achieved that state yet. A true human being is nefesh haya, a soul that has haya, life. It is alive. That living state is a state of perceiving God. That's what that means, to be a living soul. It means to have life awakened in oneself, that creative power Christ, that is to be living. 
The alternative is to awaken to shame and contempt. The shame is the shame of the soul. It's that soul that has been cast out of the Garden of Eden. That is the fallen Adam. That shame is that feeling that you feel every time you know you shouldn't do something, but you do it. That simple action proves that we are not Nefesh Haya. To do something that you know you shouldn't do proves that we are walking the wrong way on that road. Proves it. In your own experience, that's gnosis. What matters then is what you do about it. If you continue following the desires of the mind, always trying to make yourself feel happy in accordance with the desires of the ego, such as pride, envy, etc. Then you strengthen that desire continually. If lust is always bothering you and you're always satisfying that lust, that lust is only strengthening. It does not weaken that way. In the same way as if you find a baby animal in your trip in the jungle and you begin to feed it, it's going to grow. And the more you feed it, the stronger it will get. And if it's a wild animal, which it will be, having come from the jungle, when it gets strong enough, it will consume you. You may think it's your friend, and you may think it's your protector, but it is a wild animal that belongs in the jungle. It will eat you. That animal is pride, lust, envy, greed, gluttony, all of those elements that we have in our psyche. And that is the path that humanity is on. This is also easily proven. Simply take a walk anywhere in this planet. See how hard it is to find true generosity, selfless. See how difficult it is to find real chastity, sincere chastity, or diligence, people who work hard for the love of working for others expecting nothing in return. See how difficult it is to find that. How hard it is to find true patience. If you can't go all over the world to discover that, look within yourself. Observe your coworkers, your family. Observe the programming that the media is constantly shoving down our throats. What is celebrated there? Violence, murder, greed, lust, envy. There are no virtues celebrated anywhere. Anger is celebrated as a virtue on this planet. It is seen as virtuous to be a person of violence who belittles, criticizes, and puts down other people. We admire those who are most sharp with their tongue and able to skewer their fellow people with criticism and sarcasm. This is what we admire on this planet. We admire the lustful ones. We admire the arrogant. We worship the greedy. Who do we elevate as our saints in this era? But those who are most self-obsessed, celebrities, politicians, the most self-obsessed people on the planet are the ones that we worship. We don't worship the selfless ones, the truly generous. We worship those who want more money, which is very odd. All of this is pointing towards how we are related to it. Our own state of being is very much at the center of everything. Why is the planet the way it is? Why is our life the way it is? 
Why is our job the way it is? These are the questions we have when we come to these teachings. We have problems, we have complications, we have questions, we have suffering. We want to know, is there a way to not suffer with this monotonous job that I have to do? With this awful routine? Is there some other way than just to grow up, get pregnant, have a bunch of babies, and die? Is there more to life than that? When we look around, it's hard to find anything more than that. Many distractions, but no meaning. And the answer is in our level of being. What we need to comprehend is that our experience of life is directly because of our beingness. We experience life because of how we are. That's all there is to it. If we change how we are, our experience of life will change. In a very superficial way, this is very easy to see. If you wake up grumpy and you go through your day grumpy, you will have a miserable day. Miserable. And yet we fail to realize that our whole life is like that. We set the tone ourselves. If we go through our life always feeling unfulfilled, unappreciated, it's because we have set the tone because of desire. Unfulfilled, why? What is it we want? We feel unfulfilled because we don't have a Mercedes? Is that why? Well, let me tell you a secret. You'll get a Mercedes, you'll like it for 10 minutes or a week, but then you won't like it anymore. And you'll want something else. This is the nature of desire. It is never satisfied. And unfortunately, the condition of humanity is that. Never satisfied. If we continue the way we are, we will never be satisfied. And it's true when we approach religion. Many come to these types of studies, they get very excited, and they study and read and, and stuff themselves with all the books and lectures as much as they can, but then they get psychological indigestion. They don't digest it. And they feel sick and uncomfortable and think, oh, this is no good, it doesn't work. And they leave and go find something else that makes them feel better. Is it the fault of the teaching or the fault of the person? Who set the tone? Whose attitude created that scenario? If instead, we understand how to take from each moment the truth, to really experience each moment and be alive and be, then we truly digest those sensations and impressions and we take gnosis from that. In the book, The Revolution of the Dialectic, Samuel M. Vior states that. He says, Gnosis is in each moment. In other words, you can acquire knowledge simply by perceiving accurately. Wherever you are. That type of perception to be awake is how you change your beingness and how you thereby change your experience of living, of life. So our experience now is determined by how we are. If we are a grumpy person and we're always complaining about everybody else being grumpy all the time, it may be because we're grumpy all the time and we make them grumpy. You might be surprised to find that's actually what's happening. I know someone who does that. Everybody in the room is totally happy and in a good mood, but this person comes in the room grumpy and it affects everybody. And then everybody's upset. And then this person complains, why is everybody grumpy all the time? Why can't you guys be happy? Not realizing that person's the one who changed it. We all do that. 
This points out something very important in a lecture that Samael Ambior gave called Alcyon. In that lecture, he states something very important. That negative emotions, negative feelings are more contagious than any disease on this planet. And we all like to blame everybody else. We think we're saints and we go around with a good attitude all the time. But we don't realize how much we infect others with our negative feelings. So do an analysis of your life. Are you discontented? Are you unhappy? Are you unfulfilled? Then look at why that is. What is it in you that wants something? What is that want? Who wants it and why? Does it really have any importance, spiritually speaking? And furthermore, go deeper. If you discover that there are patterns in your life, situations that repeat, disagreements that continually occur, fights, problems, you're unable to succeed in certain endeavors, or you're always being stopped in a certain way, or having certain kind of problems again and again, life is not the problem. We attract circumstances according to how we are. If our life has a given quality, it's because we have the quality that attracts it. If we want to change life, we need to change how we live it. This is very difficult. But it can be done. And to do it is a matter of transforming how we perceive. Looking at things differently. What I'm showing you here is that consciousness is not a fixed thing. It is not a permanent state. It is constantly changing. It is infinite. What is consciousness? It is the ability to be alive and to perceive. What is conscious? everything that has life. We know it's true for us because we are somewhat self-aware. And we developed the term and the concept and the dictionary that explains it. Consciousness. To perceive. To be aware. But plants have consciousness too. They perceive. But not with our level of consciousness. Plant consciousness. Animals as well, more sophisticated than plants, but not yet at our level, not that different, but not yet as complex or as expansive. Minerals also, all living things have consciousness at their level, even light, even water, because they are living things. They have life. We have not recognized that scientifically yet, Broadly, even though many experiments have shown that that is what will eventually be realized by scientists. All living things have consciousness. So if we can see that just on this planet, and we understand that there's a huge range there in the potential of consciousness to experience living, and we approach that scientifically, we understand also that to perceive is a matter of using light. Isn't that true? We know that's true with our eyes. But that perception of consciousness is a light. It's an energy. But it's a light of a vibration that you don't perceive with your eyes physically. But you can perceive it. If you're sitting in a room with a lot of people, suddenly you feel something and you turn and look and someone's looking at you, how did you know it? You felt it. You can feel it when someone's looking at you because that energy is hitting you, but you don't know how you sense it, right? Not the physical senses pick that up. Your consciousness picks that up. That proves that energy functions in that way. But that's a very small example 
of its potential. The consciousness is infinite. Not only towards the heights, but towards the depths. That path that awakens towards life, if we truly enter that path, we can become angels. We can go beyond angels. Any human being can become what we would call a god. And some of them have been on this planet and have made a big shockwave. We named them Jesus, Buddha, Moses, Muhammad, Quetzalcoatl, Krishna, Moses. These are what we can call mutants. They are changed. That word mutate means change. They are no longer like us. They were once like us. That is the potential that is inside every one of us. The difficulty, though, is the state that we're in now. The consciousness cannot be awakened physically with any physical mechanism. It cannot be awakened forcibly with any mechanical tool of any kind. This is stated in the book, The Great Rebellion, by Samuel Enviar. The conscious cannot be awakened physically or with any mechanicity. Well, firstly, we know that means that we can't go on the internet or in some store and buy a little device that makes lights and sounds and that will awaken us. This is a joke. Someone's just making money off the naivety of souls. And that is a crime against humanity. Likewise, it means that no drug will awaken the consciousness towards life. A drug is a physical thing. A drug awakens the conditioned consciousness, the trapped consciousness. That's why those who drink excessively or take drugs have visions that they see hell. It also means that no physically repeated pattern can awaken consciousness. This is a difficult one for many people to accept. Many people believe that if I repeat this mantra 100,000 times, my soul will be liberated and I will be awake. And this is a fallacy. It's not true. Many people believe if I attend this school or this group or go to this ritual or pay this amount of money to this person, then I will get my astral body or I will get my kundalini or I will awaken and become an angel. These are all lies. You want to see how that's the case? Think about it deeply. What is it to awaken? To awaken to life is to become a vessel of the living power of divinity, like Moses or Buddha. It is to be an incarnation of the very power of the gods with the ability to create living things and to destroy them. Do you honestly think any being with that power would give it to you because of your money or because of how many books you read? or because of how many mantras you said, that would be extremely irresponsible. A god will only provide that power to another god, to someone who has earned it, who is trustworthy. We are not. The evidence of that is the state of the planet, the state of our lives, the state of our families, the state of our communities. We are selfish and self-obsessed, lustful, angry, and proud, filled with envy and fear. If we had the power of a God in our hands, we would make a great deal of destruction. If with the power we already have, we are creating so many problems, how many more problems would we create if we had more power? 
this situation on this planet would be far worse. This is why divinity only gives that power to those who earn it. And that requires the death of pride and lust and envy and greed and everything else. That is the difficulty of this work. It is not easy. It does not come easy. But it can happen. It can be earned. That passage that I read to you from Daniel has another sentence after that that says, And they that be wise shall shine as the Zohar of the, of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the Kalkabim forever and ever. So they that are wise. This phrase is, of course, in Hebrew, which means that it is a phrase that relates to Kabbalah. And to be wise means to have wisdom, like Solomon. To have wisdom means to have chokmah, which in Hebrew means wisdom. Chokmah is the son, the Christ, life. To be a living soul. To be on the path of life. To be awakening towards life. And they that be wise shall shine as the Zohar of the firmament. That word Zohar, Hebrew, means splendor. What is splendor but the beauty of light? And if we look into our own souls, do we see that? If we look into our experiences from moment to moment, do we see light in us? When we're walking in the street, when we're dealing with people, do we see that we respond to others spontaneously and naturally, continually, with an outpouring of love? Or do we see in ourselves continual conflict, anger, resentment, craving, fear, worry, stress, tension, wanting and wanting? That is not light. That is darkness. And that phrase continues, and the wise shall shine as the Zohar of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars or mercuries forever and ever. That word kao kabim in Hebrew means stars. But it also means mercury. Mercury, of course, is the secret of alchemy. Mercury is that fire in us that must be transformed and purified. And those that are wise, that have life, shine resplendent like the stars, like Mercury the God who flies in the heavens, unfettered by anything, able to go to the heights and to the depths. And this is the great gift that Hermes Mercury has. He can go anywhere, awakened. That is the state of a living soul. A living soul is not trapped in a physical body, like in prison. A living soul is not trapped in their monotonous, decaying life, but instead is able to escape that physical body and go to the heavens and go to the hells in order to continually not only awaken more, but help others. That is what it means to actually be on the path of life, to be achieving those states. I point these things out because it's very important that we are very clear about how we approach these types of studies. These teachings are not a game. They are not just for fun. They're not a distraction or a theory to play with. They are, in fact, very dangerous. The one who plays games with these teachings will be punished by the gods. And the evidence of that is throughout history. Even awakened masters who mistakenly went against the will of their own being and suffer the consequences. So when we approach these types of teachings, we need to do that with a great deal of 
self-awareness of what we're doing and why. Constantly revising ourselves, checking ourselves. Do you have any questions? Can you talk a little bit about how um, there is no mechanical way to awaken consciousness? And um, I'm going to uh, recount a tale that I, I, I heard from my friend. Um, he bought one of those machines that is said to awaken the consciousness. And apparently it sends, uh, it, it sends some sort of like the electric pulses into the brain or whatnot. And he used this machine, and he was, he was very thrilled with the results. And now um, I'm just re recounting what he said to me. He said he experienced things like hyper-awareness of the environment, single-pointed contemplation, astral projection, all these sorts, of, uh, these sorts of things that we often associate phenomenally with an awakened consciousness. Um, how, uh, how are we to understand that? It's a very good question, and I'm glad you asked. <laughs> what I stated, or I attempted to say, maybe I wasn't clear, was that it is impossible to awaken the consciousness towards the life, the light, with those types of mechanical approaches. It, those can awaken consciousness, those machines, just like drugs can, but they awaken conditioned consciousness. To go deeper into our explanation of our current state of conditioning, when we sincerely do an inventory of our psyche, we discover that somewhere around 97% of our consciousness is trapped. And only a very tiny fraction remains free, unconditioned. That little fraction is our only hope. And we find that symbolized in many teachings. For example, David and Goliath. Goliath represents the conditioned consciousness, the, the beast that great warrior that's leading the hordes of egos, that whole battlefield represents the spiritual warfare. And David is that child, and all he has is his faith in God and his stone, which is the mercury. But it's enough to overcome the giant. The problem is, humanity is very impressed with big things, like the following the crowds. So when humanity approaches spirituality and religion, we always go where the crowds are. And what do the crowds always want? Instant feedback. Something for nothing. Cheap, free, easy. Promises. Guarantees. In other words, humanity is lazy and wants to go to heaven like that, easily. That's not possible. It's impossible. So these machines, different devices, different uh, sounds, different mantras, different chemicals, different plants, many different techniques that are being utilized nowadays to supposedly awaken consciousness. They do awaken consciousness, but the conditioned consciousness. The experiences that people have, they perceive things, but they have nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with divinity. Nothing to do with awakening in the light. They are illusions that seduce the naive. And those that become hypnotized by those things and continue to pursue them become black magicians. In other words, demons. These are very common. This, pot, this planet is hugely populated by what you can call demons, witches, sorcerers. People that are pursuing that way of awakening. Why? Because it's very easy. It's very easy because 97% of our consciousness is already enmeshed in the underworld. The subconsciousness. The infraconsciousness. What we can call hell. What is a demon but anger personified? Lust. Envy. Those are demonic qualities, which we have in abundance. It's easy to awaken the consciousness in those elements. Very simple. All you have to do is strengthen them more. Commit certain types of behaviors, certain types of actions. And that consciousness will awaken easily. And you will have all kinds of powers, but as a demon. And this happens. I was just contacted recently by someone who had a similar experience. Met some people who seemed to be very serious about spirituality, was told do A, B, C, and D, 
The person did A, B, C, and D. They had all kinds of experiences from it. But fortunately, this person still has that 3% free and listened to it. And that 3% felt terrified, felt remorse, felt this is wrong. And instead of pursuing the desire, sought help and how to fix it and get out of that problem. Unfortunately, there's already a karma at play. That person has to suffer certain consequences because of that curiosity. But that, the good thing is that they still have enough consciousness not trapped yet that they did feel that sense of, I shouldn't do that. This is wrong. I really shouldn't do that anymore. Let me get out of here. That is what we had to listen to. That sense of right and wrong. That's the free consciousness. That is our guide to lead us back. And if we really use it and constantly work with it, it gets stronger and stronger. And as we liberate more consciousness from our ego, it gets stronger and stronger. Good question. Any other questions? Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so it's illusion. Right? The same thing here, like, you know, we just talked about this. I mean, at the end, a lot of people, a lot of, you know, people argue that it's illusion anyway. You know, the sense of consciousness, you know. Well, this is the difficulty, and that's a step for later in the work, when someone's actually learning how to perceive things, and that perception deepens then they start to see that things actually don't exist. That's a perception that you have only if you're working seriously with meditation. The, the next step is to realize that there are two truths and they exist simultaneously. And that's why we talk about the paramitas, especially pranya paramita, which shows the interdependence of those two truths. That yes, what we perceive here does not exist as we perceive it. And when we perceive with the pure consciousness, we see that it doesn't exist at all, right? Nevertheless, it exists. And that duality or that um, seeming contradiction is actually the way things are. But it's, it makes no sense to the intellect. So to play with that in philosophy just results in confusion. It's something that one has to experience through actual comprehension. It's first to experience it, and then to understand it. That's a long process. But philosophically speaking, that's why we try to always talk about the two truths, because otherwise you can fall on one side or the other and say everything exists as it is, or nothing exists, and that causes problems. And traditionally, that's been a big problem with a lot of religions, especially in Buddhism, and in Hinduism also, because many meditators would start to perceive, well, nothing exists. None of this is real. So then they started doing whatever they wanted killing, raping, thinking nothing was real. I'm being, this is, this is real. This is actually what has happened in some of these schools. And it's happening now. There are people now in all around the world who follow certain traditions who say, because that is true, because we know that the absolute is there and fundamentally nothing really exists, it doesn't matter what we do. It doesn't matter about the ego. It's going to get dissolved anyway. It doesn't really exist. So let's go all go get drunk. And they do that. They meditate and then they go get drunk and then they sleep around. They've forgotten the most fundamental thing, the very basis of the entire path and the very basis of existence itself, which is cause and effect. Sure, things don't exist precisely because cause and effect ultimately balances it. But do you really want to go through the process of the balancing? Because if you commit a harmful action, you have to undo it. And normally, that's through pain. There's no exception to that. That's why the Buddha himself said, even when you enter into Tantra, never forget the fundamentals of cause and effect. But these people forget that. 
because their desire has seduced them. That's the great danger. So even when we're studying the elevated aspects of the philosophy, we have to always remember it is always harmonious with the very foundation. Always. Good, good question, though. In the back. That's a great question. So the question is, should we stop doing ritualistic practices in order to avoid awakening negatively? No, of course not. We teach how to practice and develop self-discipline to perform certain practices, especially meditation daily, but also utilizing mantras and prayers and using incense and other types of, you could say, ritualistic or, or uh, physical means in order to aid us. The point is, don't do them mechanically. Do them with a great deal of awareness of what you're doing. Be awake. As a simple example, in some traditions, they believe if you repeat this mantra 100,000 times or half a million times, that you will just, right when you hit 499,999 and you say it one more time, all of a sudden your spiritual eyes will open and you will see the universe as it truly exists and you will be liberated. This is so foolish, but they believe that. It's it completely against laws of nature. It makes no sense. The reality is you can use a mantra once and it can awaken you. One time. In fact, you don't even need the mantra. If you have the energy and you know how to awaken and be fully present, you can perceive. It's a matter of willpower. And this is our problem. We don't have it. It's all trapped in our ego. We have a lot of willpower in our desires. When we want something egotistically, we will go to work for 50 years to get that little retirement package or whatever we're chasing. But when we hear spirituality is going to take years and years or a whole life, we think, eh, too hard. Because all of our will, our desire, is trapped in materialism, in sensations, lust and anger, etc. So do the practices, but do them with awareness. If you're doing your practice mechanically, thinking about other things, you're wasting your time. You will neither awaken positively or negatively. So in the books of Samuel and Vior, he teaches us how to take the Eucharist at home. Very important and beautiful practice and ritualistic. And it's very powerful to help us. If you do that at home and you do it with a great deal of self-cognizance, very aware of yourself and remembering your being, feeling and reaching out for the presence of the divine, that practice will bring you so much benefit. It truly will transform you, especially if you are persistent and keep doing it. But if you're doing it every day, even for 25 years, and while you're doing it, you're thinking about that TV show you can't wait to watch, or you're thinking that you got to go do the laundry and you take your bread and wine, it will do nothing. You're just eating plain old bread and wine. What makes the difference is being it's you. We ourselves are what make us awaken. No one else. No teacher can awaken you. Even the Buddha said it. I cannot save you. You have to save yourselves. His dying statement was, be a light unto yourself. That light is the Christ, that energy that we have to become aware of in ourselves. It's the only way. So whatever practice we do, do it with awareness every time. And everything we do, when you're washing the dishes, do it that way. Simply washing, being fully aware of yourself, fully present. And when you talk to someone, be fully present with them. Fully present and aware and kind. And I'm telling you, 
that simple shift, being present, will change everything. And if you're continuing to do it constantly, you will enter the path towards life. And things will change. Everything will change. Sometimes you have to pay karma. Sometimes it takes a while. But it does happen. There were a bunch of questions here, so please. What is true chastity? Chastity. What is true, true chastity is knowing how to use the sexual energy in harmony with divinity. Our own inner divinity. We have sexual energy because we need it. That's what makes a living being. But unfortunately, we've all learned how to use it through lust, through desire, for power, for pleasure. But sexual energy actually has a profound purpose, which is to elaborate the soul, to nourish the spirit. So when we learn to utilize that energy in that way, we develop our soul. We feed and nourish our soul. It is a use of it in a wise way. It is to not waste it. It's a science. We have lots of books about that that explain. The basis of it is to restrain that energy, to no longer expel the energy through the orgasm, to restrain it, transform it, and recirculate it. So that energy that was previously used as a stimulant for a brief moment of pleasure then becomes the food that nourishes the soul to experience the ecstasies of the spirit what you can call samadhi. It's the same fuel. So anyone who's experienced the, ex the sensation of the orgasm, if they renounce that sensation, longing for the spiritual gifts, that same energy is what provides the fuel that springs the soul back to the divine. It's the same force, but purified. That's why all religions traditionally taught, first learn to be a monk or nun, Save that energy on your own. And then when you're well-trained in it, then you enter the sexual act and do the same thing. And this is why Paul said, be with your spouse as though you were still unmarried. That was the meaning hidden there. Unite as your duty as husband and wife, but don't waste that energy. Instead, enter an act of prayer. Transform that energy. And it takes the couple back towards the divine, back to Eden. Eden means bliss. That's the bliss of how that energy fuels the blossom of real love that grows in the soul. So chastity is that, whether one is single or in a couple. It's learning to respect the sexual energy and realize that it is the power of God in us. To no longer treat it like something for animal pleasure. Another question? Lots. Okay, here. Right. So it seems as though if we're doing these practices, if we're not, um, if we're not looking at those egos, comprehending them, and disintegrating those egos, that we're not freeing up any of that ninety-seven percent. That's exactly right. If we're not meditating on the ego and dissolving the ego, we are not liberating the consciousness. This is why we emphasize it constantly. Yes, it's important to transform the sexual energy. It's essential. Yes, it's important to self-remember. Yes, it's important to self-observe. It is important to study the scripture, the Bible, the Kabbalah, the sutras, the tantras. All these are necessary because they provide information. But if we are not dissolving the ego, we will accomplish only becoming a devil. Period. End of story. Any effort towards self-realization that does not include dissolution of the ego will result in failure. That's the very end of, I think it's revolutionary psychology, that sentence. It's either psych revolutionary psychology or great rebellion. I study them at the same time usually, so sometimes I get them mixed. It's one of the two books. These two books actually fully express what I tried to condense in today's lecture. Treatise of Revolutionary Psychology and the Great Rebellion. Any student of this tradition who has not read that is not studying Gnosis. Those books give the central core clue 
which is the psychology and meditation. To really know what Gnosis is, you must understand the psychology very deeply. And you must understand how to meditate very well. We, all these other things are important. That's why we talk about them. But none of them are more important than knowing how to eliminate the ego. None of them. It's the most important thing. That's why I brought it up today. So, another question? Uh, yeah, what's the difference between like, uh, awakening in pre-talk or pre-talk and descending into Oh, that's a great question. So what's the difference between awakening in Klipoth or descending into it in order to understand it? The truth is we are all already in hell, Klipoth. And when we sleep and dream, our dream are there because that's where our mind is. Our mind is an aspect of hell. It's filled with all of our desires and fears and traumas, etc. When we begin the process of awakening consciousness, if we are following the broad, narrow path to destruction that Jesus described, then we're awakening as a demon, which means we're awakening the consciousness that's trapped in the ego, and we will awaken as an ego as a devil. That process is easy and many millions of people are on that path. And they awaken, but only in that realm. And they think that they're awakening positively. They think that they are saints. They think that they are doing good because they are only seeing according to their desires. They don't see reality. The other thing that I mentioned was descending there in order to see it and understand it. And that's what an initiate does who's awakening in the light, awakening in life. In that context, we awaken consciousness, but the freed consciousness. The consciousness that can go to the heavens or it can go into the hell realms in order to investigate oneself. This is necessary, especially when dealing with deeper egos, egos that are harder to see from the physical world. So we learn to meditate or get out of the body during the night in order to go into those realms to look into the roots of our egos and to understand them and sometimes to help other people as well but in that case we would be awake in the light not as a demon we would see reality not the illusion not be a victim of the illusions of that realm does that make sense it's kind of hard to put in words but okay It's a matter of the condition, the state of your being. Now, the tricky part is, if you're learning to awaken the free consciousness through the processes that we describe, and then you have an experience where you awaken consciousness in the internal worlds, so you're in the astral world, then you don't know, am I in the superior part or the inferior part? Am I in the heavenly aspect or the hellish aspect? And as a beginner, you can't tell. It's hard to tell because the consciousness doesn't have the, the strength, the energy to cut through appearances and see the reality. So for beginners, especially for a long period of time until you develop a lot of experience, it's really hard to know. And that's why we teach the conjurations and prayers. Those channel forces from our own being to help clarify that atmosphere and help us to see if what we're seeing is our own hell realm or we're seeing the real thing objectively. So there's two ways to see, subjectively and objectively. The whole lecture I was giving was about how in our daily lives, we see everything subjectively, filtered through our desire, filtered through our memories and our traumas. And I'm trying to emphasize that we need to see objectively during the day, to cut through that and really see people for what they are, see ourselves for what we are. Because then when we go out of the body every night when we sleep, we will start to do it there too we will start to see that our dreams are just dreams. They're projections. And we'll start to see what's really going on. That's a gradual process. When, when you say you're awakening from the void or the dark, does that mean that you're from the uh, true self or what? You're you will see them according to the power of the consciousness that you have. If your consciousness is very weak, which it is for all of us, you will only be able to see a certain amount. So for us, for example, if you get in a conversation, you notice that usually when you're in a conversation, you're not really listening to the other person. You're thinking about 
how that you're reacting to it or what you're going to say next or something else you want to talk about. It's rare that we're actually really concentrated on the other person, what they feel or what they say. We're usually still in our own world. So the beginning is to start to see and really listen and really see people and really be there with them. And with that, the more that we awaken and the more perceptive we become, we start to gain insight into each other. And mostly that comes from having insight into ourselves. Little by little, that gives us the ability to start to understand what people really mean when they say things. And we have fewer disagreements, misunderstandings, because we understand each other better. Most of the arguments we have are because we didn't understand what somebody else was trying to say. We misunderstand, we get angry, we get upset, and fights start. Exactly. We're not. Almost never. We're always thinking, what do they think about me? You know? We're never really thinking, are they really okay? Are they really well? What are they trying to say? We're never really that interested in other people. We only want to know if they like us, if they approve of us, and then we're okay. And if they don't like us or don't approve us, we're going to do whatever we can or say whatever we can to get them to like us or approve of us. And once they do, then we go. <laughs> really, that's the gist of most conversations. We're really not that interested in each other because we're so egotistical. So if we shift that, if we really become interested in the other person and understand them, everything will change. This sounds so easy. It isn't. And listen, this is in a book, too, by Samael Envior, Introduction to Gnosis. He talks about this, but none of the Gnostics do it. They all think, oh, that book's for beginners. We're all beginners. That book explains very clearly, if you really want to succeed in business, learn to listen. It's not that hard. Just have to remember to do it. Another question in the back? Any others? Yes. Kind of in the middle of your lecture, you said uh, a lot of the outside world really is, has really nothing to do with gnosis at all. It's the opposite. I kind of find that the more meditation I do with myself, I find it to be more and more true that I can't ignore it anymore. Do you find sometimes that you almost wonder where to kind of draw the line with? You almost find yourself not just associating with the world, you find less in common with a lot of areas. And you're almost kind of like shutting, participating in everything in order to be like be more connected and more connected and everything else. I kind of I guess I always I always try and find a balance. Probably always reevaluating things continuously. Mm. Is that a you I guess where do you kind of figure this out? Or I think you have to strike a balance. Yeah. As we, I understand what you're saying because I've experienced the same thing. The more you meditate and study yourself and the teachings, the more you realize that this world is repetitive and uninteresting and painful and you don't feel drawn to do the things that you were doing before and you want to withdraw a little bit or be separate in some way. And I think that's necessary, especially when you need time to strengthen your practice and strengthen your comprehension and strengthen your soul. So my advice in those times is to try to get to nature. Try to go to places where you can really be back in touch with this planet. Go to the forest or the beach or the mountains and spend time, even if it's only an hour. But that time spent, especially really awake and aware, can really nourish your heart. But I think at the same time, all of us have families and responsibilities, so we can't withdraw completely. You know, we need to contribute to society to the best of our ability, especially the people that depend on us, our, our families and our coworkers and our employers. Those places we really need to make a sincere effort, even though sometimes we don't want to be there and it's difficult. Well, yeah, I, I mean, that's kind of exactly what you're saying. There's a balance. I understand. I, I have yeah. responsibilities and must take care of them. But, on the other, but you also know on the other side, it's really ridiculous with a lot of it. And it just sounds too like it's satisfying. I, like, I think like we've said in other lectures, you, you naturally come to a place where you realize, I don't need to watch TV like everybody else is watching. I'm going to turn it off. I'm going to go outside. I'm going to have a garden, or I'm going to 
go for a walk or I'm going to spend time with my neighbor. You know, doing things that are more contributive to others rather than just, you know, being hypnotized by the internet or the television. And also going to parties or family things and all these sort of social responsibilities, they can be cut, cut out. I mean, we don't have much time. We don't know how long we're going to be alive. We don't know how much time we have to practice. And any moment that we can take to really be and deepen our connection with our innermost, we need to take advantage of that and use it well. Any other question? Yeah. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Everything that is in our life, as we said in the lecture, is in our life because of how we are. Everything, without exception. And if we want to change our life, we change how we are. That means taking advantage of what we have. Okay, problem number one, I hate my job. Okay, so let's transform our experience of that job. It doesn't mean we have to go find a new job. It might. Something only you can know. But maybe that you need that job. Maybe you can't get another job for some reason. Who knows what your own circumstances are. But is it possible that you can simply change your attitude about that job? Instead of going there filled with resentment and despair and you know dragging your feet and miserable all the time, can you go there and treat it like a spiritual service that the people you work for and with need your help, and if you provide that help with a good attitude, you may actually start to enjoy it. Same with dealing with family and friends and all the responsibilities that we have. All of those are there because of how we are. If we change our attitude to them and change how we relate with them, everything in life changes. So we're talking about changing our level of being. It begins with that. But the real transformation, the radical one, only comes when we destroy the ego. We can have the best attitude in the world, but if we have the ego alive, we will suffer. Others will suffer. We will not achieve liberation. The ego must be eliminated. And so this is why we emphasize it every day. We need to, at the end of the day, take time to retrospect all the experiences we had that day and to note the ones that are of particular importance and then to meditate on them. Whatever time we can put into it. If it's a few minutes, use that. If you have more time, do it. If you can sacrifice some sleep, do it. This is the core practice of this tradition. It isn't transmutation, it isn't runes, it isn't anything else. It's to meditate on the ego daily. This is the core. Without that, the rest doesn't mean anything. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah.